was, was not really well prepared for his job when he got it. Um, I do not believe he would have invaded Iraq if 9-11 hadn't happened. I think it uh, and a bunch of other things, and, and basically his administration and he panicked and did a bunch of really stupid things in a state of panic, um, which was, fortunately doesn't happen all that often, I think. Yes, ma'am. Um, that brings us to grassroots uh, movements. What do you have to say about boycott, divestment, and yes. sanction? Um, the, the question is, what do I think about the uh, BDS, the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement? Um, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm still sort of, you know, wavering on this one. Um, uh, my, my instincts are almost always to be opposed to such ideas, um, particularly when they target um, or include within them academics, intellectuals, things like that, because I don't like anything that interferes with the free exchange of ideas. Uh, and that's true of regardless of the country it, involved. Um, so, you know, uh, I was uh, a latecomer, let's say, back in the dark ages to uh, the divestment movement on South Africa for sort of the same reasons. I think I was wrong, by the way, about that, but that, it's just my, my instincts are always, you know, uh, to be very, very wary of that. Um, that said, um, my opposition is not as reflexive as it was, say, three, four years ago. And it's in part because as I have become more and more convinced that the two-state solution via a negotiated settlement is just not going to happen. And it's not going to happen for a number of reasons, but among them is the A, intransigence of the current Israeli government and the rightward movement of Israeli politics, which has been happening for quite some time. Then it seems to me people who are concerned about this issue have to say, well, what's left to us? Yes. Right? And and I don't consider the BDS movement to be you know, fundamentally anti-Semitic. I don't think it is a challenge uh, to the existence of a Jewish state in Palestine. I think it is an attempt to bring social pressure to bear um, and rally public support where the final outcome of that pressure is somewhat unspecified or indeterminate. Um, so I have moved on that, but I wouldn't say I, you know, I've never signed a BDS petitioner letter or anything like that or publicly embraced it. And I, I guess I'd have to say I'm not, I haven't gotten ready to do that yet, but I might. Joe, do you think uh, the Republican Congress is driven more by their hate for Obama and want him to fail versus their blind support of Bibi, who they worship instead of 25 times? <coughs> Pretty much president of the United States or Messiah, one of the two. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I, I could Repeat not. Repeat your question. Well, oh, sorry. Do, do I think that um, the GOP in particular uh, support for Israel is driven by their deep antipathy towards Obama, or is it a sort of a deep affection, respect, admiration for Netanyahu as revealed by the standing ovations that they gave him? Um, I don't think it's really either one. I think this was a cheap way. I mean, there are probably a handful of congressmen for whom that, that might, the latter might be true, that this is you know, deep fervor. But I, I think this was a cheap way of demonstrating your, your pro-Israel credentials. Um, and it had the ancillary benefit of, to some degree, embarrassing uh, President Obama. Uh, so, yes, I think at least some members of Congress were probably inspired by that, but uh, it's always very hard to tell. I, I don't know what's inside someone's head or inside someone's heart. I don't know exactly what is making them stand up or sit down at a particular time. I might add, though, I think that whole incident actually backfired badly, right, because it was seen as such a disrespectful move and it was a bunch of American politicians basically saying, we are siding with a foreign leader. Yeah, it's a leader from a country we all like, but it's a foreign leader. And that makes many Americans very uncomfortable for all the obvious, obvious reasons. 
Uh, I'm all in favor of political contestation. We should argue about our politics. But there's a point at which you, you know, sort of say, wait a minute, this is a little bit troublesome. And by the way, the same thing is happening with the Iran deal as well. It is forcing people to, who normally, uh, slight digression here, um, in the United States, we accept, uh, as part of our politics, that people have lots of different attachments and loyalties. We are patriotic, we love our country, but we also love our children. Some of us like our employers. Uh, we have lots of different attachments to religion, and we have, we have attachments to other countries. Right? We have dual citizenship in this country, and that's, that's dual loyalty. That's having loyalty to two countries. Oh, that's perfectly okay. Some of us are really fond of foreign countries because we lived there at some point in our lives and we developed a real affection for their culture and their society as well. We all understand that we can have a lot of these attachments. And most of the time there's no tension between them. Right? Now, I think for many Americans who are very strongly pro-Israel, they are loyal Americans, they, they love this country, they also have a very powerful attachment to Israel, and most of the time those things aren't in conflict, and especially not in conflict in their heads. What's good for America is good for Israel, and what's good for Israel is good for America. Right? But every now and then, there's going to be moments when the interests of the two countries diverge. And what you're seeing with the Iran deal is a moment where people suddenly have to decide. Right? That, you know, gee, most of the American people seem to support this deal. A majority of American Jews seem to support this deal. Bibi Netanyahu really hates this deal. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, where am I going to end up here? And, you know, if people can make their own decisions, and I am not condemning people who I happen to disagree with on this issue. It's just one of those moments that's exposed the rift a little bit more. Right? And, and you know, we'll see how it plays out over time. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just wondering, I've heard many of the arguments that you've made, and I've heard many of the GOP candidates saying that the Iran deal means that um, <coughs> We have to get permission before they go in and check anything. And they can delay it uh, as long as they want. And let me say other things. She was in spread ways. And they get to get to choose yeah. the inspectors. That's yeah. another one. Yeah, there's and then, then I also <laughs> heard that the contradiction is someone who's supposed to know something about nuclear weapons said that there's no way they can hurry up and get rid of everything and, you know, in just a short length of time if they had them. So, I was just wondering. Okay, yeah, no, no, there's a number of, there's a number of different arguments in there. Let me try it, if I can deal with all of them. So, the, so one aspect of the deal has to do with uh, inspections. First of all, the existing Iranian nuclear facilities are going to be under constant 24-hour monitoring with various devices that monitor, keep track of what's going on there, including cameras watching what everybody's doing. So those things are, it's not a question of asking permission. They are being inspected and monitored now and will be in the future. The, the question you're raising is, what about, uh, we th we're worried about this building over here that we've never looked at before. We suddenly think something suspicious might be going on there. All right, if uh, we say we want to go look in that building, um, if Iran drags its feet on letting us into that building, I think the maximum amount they can drag their feet is 24 days. Right. right. So what you have to ask yourself is how much do you think they could accomplish in 24 days or how much do you think they could hide in 24 days that would be of significance that we wouldn't be able to detect. And by the way, if this happens four or five or six or seven or eight times, right? You know, we start scratching our heads and say, we think something suspicious is going on here. We can decide that they're not abiding by the agreement. And then the sanctions can snap back. So the 24 days doesn't apply. It only applies to new facilities that, or new suspected facilities that we start to wonder about. And then it's only 24 days. That's point number one. Um, point number two, do the Iranians get to do the inspections? Um, no. The inspections are done by the International Atomic Energy Agency. They've been doing this around the world for decades as part of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They go in and they negotiate an agreement with the country for how to do it. Right? But notice, they have to have their own people in there to make the inspections work. But Iran wants to have some people there while the inspections are being taking place 
too. Why? Well, they, and you have to put yourself with an Iranian hat on for a second, they worry that maybe someone will come in and plant a bunch of, you know, throw a bunch of uranium on the floor and say, see? And they want to be able to say, no, 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 we were standing right there, we had our camera running, and here came this guy in and he dumped some uranium on the floor and then said we were cheating. <laughs> right? So to make this work, both sides have to be um, confident that they won't interfere with the inspections or that the inspectors won't plant evidence, essentially. And that's why you have a, a mutual arrangement uh, and it's, I think, worked you know, quite well over many, many decades in many cases. Last point I would make, it's possible, as with any very complicated international agreement, that there will not be perfect compliance. Um, that's been true of most internet, true of trade agreements, it's true of earlier arms control agreements, and there is, has to be a dispute resolution mechanism where sometimes we think we see something, the Iranians have to come say, no, it isn't what you thought it was, here's what really happened, etc. Um, and that may be true in some cases here. The question is, how strategically significant might small violations be? And again, I'm not trying to give Iran a pass. If they try and cheat on the agreement, we will catch it and we should then respond appropriately. But the mere fact that somebody could cheat on one little aspect of this arrangement doesn't necessarily mean that we wake up with a mushroom cloud tomorrow. Uh, a friend of mine likes to put it this way, we've reached an agreement with Iran that they cannot build a car. That's what, imagine it with that. We just, no, Iran cannot build cars. Now, if we see a couple of Iranians over in the corner working on spark plug designs, that's a concern. But the fact that they're learning how to make a spark plug doesn't necessarily mean that there's about to be a car going through the room, right, 24 days later, or, or anything like that. So we are going to, this Given the political salience of this agreement, the amount of attention that's going to be paid to whether or not they are abiding by it is going to be enormous, particularly in, in the initial years. And I'm pretty confident that if there's any kind of significant violation, we will know about it and then we will respond uh, appropriately. So that, I think that's a concern that opponents have raised, but it's not ultimately a really serious one. Sorry, very long-winded answer. Fred. Did I hear you say that you think a two-state uh, solution is still possible between Israel no. and No, I said I didn't think it was possible. I mean, nothing is impossible if people will it and if they really want to, but given the current constellation of political forces, I don't see how one can pull it off. I, I don't see how you get enough settlers out of the West Bank to create a viable Palestinian state, and I don't see the political will to do that in the Israeli body politic right now. Dr. Hayhurst. This is a somewhat Machiavellian question, but is there any evidence that any recent U.S. administration has actively fomented antagonism between the Shia and the Sunni factions in the Middle East to keep them up one another's throat, so to speak, rather than going after the West? Um, I, I've never repeat, seen, repeat. yeah, the question is, is there any evidence that suggests that the United States has deliberately tried to foment Shia versus Sunni antipathy to sort of keep the place at its, keep them all at each other's throats so they're not focused on, on us. I have never seen any evidence, I know there are people who suspect that that's what's happening, that there has always been some um, master American plan to keep the place just endlessly churning. Uh, I don't, I've never seen any convincing evidence that we've ever tried to do anything like that. And it's mostly because, um, first of all, it's not like the, the Middle East was unifying against us anyway. I mean, there were already deep political divisions. We hardly needed to make bigger ones. And second, if you think about it, the divisions between Sia and Shuni are a huge headache for us now. Right, makes it much more difficult to get any kind of collaboration against ISIS. It complicates our relationship with the Gulf states vis-a-vis -vis Iran, etc. This is an enormous headache for us. And that, by the way, just uh, something we often forget, and particularly where I hang out, people often forget. Um, 
The United States is basically in very good shape, right? If you compare us to almost any country, you wouldn't want to trade places with any country except maybe Denmark. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we're we're relative. We're still relatively wealthy. We're still very powerful. We're over here in the Western Hemisphere. We got no enemies nearby, etc. We're in pretty good shape. And and when you're in as good a shape as the United States is in, peace is actually good for you, right? The only thing that could really screw the United States up is some enormous conflagration or some major, another major financial meltdown. Right? Those are the two things that could really hurt us. So we therefore do not actually have much interest in fomenting conflict in other parts of the world, because once you get a lot of conflicts going, you never kind of be sure what happens to them. They may, in fact, come back to bite you. So I occasionally like to remind people that Americans ought to be very interested in peace and stability. It's even a word we ought to be able to use every now and then in our political discourse. And by the way, back to your, your question about the, uh, the candidates, it'll be interesting to see how many of them are willing to use the word peace at any point in their campaign rhetoric. You might sort of keep track of that one. Yes, sir. I just wanted to thank you for coming for a while and sharing your expertise and being as objective as possible. Um, you mentioned early on that the United States has three main uh, strategic interests, two of which are preventing anti-American terrorism and nuclear proliferation. I liked your opinion that the United States should have a more business-like approach to some of these actors in the Middle East by allowing them to shoulder the burden in regards to some of these issues because they have more vested interests. Could it be possible that U.S. diplomats have been, um, they've made concessions in regards to an Iranian nuclear deal because, you know, Iranian forces have provided support to some Iraqi troops in their fighting with ISIS? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the kind words. And uh, second, uh, I think the thrust of the question, tell me if I'm wrong, is, is it possible that we, made some concessions or compromised in the nuclear negotiations with Iran in order to encourage or reward Iran for helping in the fight against ISIS. Is that, that the yeah, question? So. Yeah, okay. I don't think so. I mean, first of all, the Iran negotiation, the nuclear negotiations were already proceeding before ISIS became a, a big problem. Uh, that's point one. Point two, we've actually been very ambivalent about the Iranian role in, in Iraq vis-a-vis -vis ISIS. We can't quite decide what bothers us more, the Islamic State, which bothers us for all the obvious reasons, or something that might, over the longer term, further enhance or institutionalize Iranian influence in Iraq. And by the way, that's true the other way around, too. Iran is ambivalent about our role in Iraq today. They don't like ISIS either. Right? But they also don't like the fact that this is pulling the United States back into some military engagement there as well. And one of the reasons the Islamic State is still around is that all of the parties that don't like it can't decide if it's their biggest problem or just one of several. The Turks don't like ISIS at all, but they don't like Assad, and they really don't like Kurdish independence. <laughs> Right? So they don't know what to do about ISIS, because if it helps the Kurds, that's bad for them. The Saudis don't like ISIS at all, but they don't like Iran either. So anything that helps, you know, and therefore ISIS, to some degree, doesn't get a free pass, but it doesn't get anybody's focused attention because everybody's priorities are conflicting a little bit, which is a very long way of answering. says, I don't think these two things got linked. Right? I think that we did the nuclear deal pretty much on its own terms, for good or ill, one can argue about how well we did negotiating, but I don't think what's happening with ISIS has much to do with that. Yes, sir. Yes, um, what's your opinion, your opinion back to the American-Israeli relationship, the lobby and pro-Israel and all that, from your vantage point, from your experience, uh, the powers that be, the power players that are actually playing this out, what role does Christianity, the religion of Christianity, have to do realistically in that here in 2015? Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm thinking, you know, there's a thinking that's been going, you know, we want to be on God's side when we're getting the curse, that kind of stuff. What is Christianity's 
indeed, is Christianity as a religion still influence people's thinking that the high level is a factor or not? Um, that's a, it's a great question, and there is actually a section in our book where we, where we talk a little bit about this, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, I'd say there's, there's a couple of points to this. One is... Um, Repeat your question. Yeah, sorry. What's the relationship between the U.S. relationship with Israel and the role of Christianity? Uh, the, what connection does this have to our support, to our attitudes? Uh, is that a fair summary? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think um, that for a lot of Americans who don't pay much attention to the Middle East, um, there is some affinity uh, for Israel based on sort of, you know, Judeo-Christian tradition, even just at the level, you know, I've heard about these people, I hear read about King David, I know about, uh, you know, Solomon and all that. No, no, I'm serious, you know, if you've been to, look, I, I had to go to Sunday school for many years and uh, all that stuff from the Old Testament got hammered in there. Right, so I've, and there's a sort of a, a loose cultural association. I don't think that does, that helps a little bit, right? Uh, but it doesn't drive it, because after all, the dirty little secret is that American Christianity, at least some parts of American Christianity, you go back not very far, it's got some sort of pretty nasty anti-Semitic dimensions to it as well. So, you know, Christianity by itself is, is ambivalent in terms of support for Israel. The exception to what I've just said is the phenomenon of Christian Zionism. Yeah. Right? Christian Zionism is the Christian part of the Israel lobby. And this is a theological movement. It comes out of a 19th century movement called dispensationalism, which sees the second coming, the rapture, all of that being preordained by a series of signs. One of which is one of those signs is the return of Jews to the Holy Land, right? And their control of the Holy Land. So Christian Zionists are big pro-Israel supporters. They are big supporters of uh, the occupation because Israel is supposed to control all of it. And then there's this whole theology about Armageddon and wars coming and, and stuff like that. Um, there's an Israeli writer who has a great comment about Christian Zionism. Um, because one of the things, if you look at their full set of writings, is, well, what happens when the rapture shows up to the Jews in Israel? It's not a pretty picture. Right? And, and this, this Israeli writer said, you know, that this is a group that doesn't really love us, doesn't really love Israel. We're characters in their play. It's a five-act play, and we disappear in Act Four. <laughs> anyway, but having, having, having said that, they they have some political. There have been some politicians who uh, have espoused Christian Zionist beliefs, uh, defend that as the reason why they are very hardline supporters of Israel. And I think if you follow, wait, I'd say two other things. I don't think the Old Testament is actually a really great guide to foreign policy. That's just my, my personal view. Uh, and, and secondly, I think if you follow Christian Zionist precepts, uh, nothing but harm will come to Israel. I do, I do want to just add that uh, uh, one of the foremost Christian Zionists is Reverend John Hagee out of San Antonio uh, uh, in, in uh, in Texas, he began the organization Christians United for Israel, and they have annual uh, Love for Israel rallies in Washington, D.C. every year. And one of the premier keynote speakers a couple of years ago was uh, Governor Mike Pence. Uh, he was not governor at the time, he was Representative Mike Pence, but Mike Pence has been a real supporter of John Hagee. And in fact, when uh, Governor Pence and his family uh, went to uh, Israel this past December, it was his trip and the trip of his family was funded by uh, Christian United for Israel. Dr. Tool. Yes, hi, thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question has to do with uh, your proposed policy approach of uh, offshore balancing and uh, making special relationships <coughs> less special. And so I'm wondering, is this a one-size-fits-all solution globally, do you think, for other areas that are problematic for, for the United States from a national security perspective. And I'm particularly interested in the comparison you brought up at the end of, of your talk with, with East Asia. Obviously, we have a lot, a lot of challenges there. So would the same approach work well there, despite the somewhat different nature of those challenges? Um, 
Okay, this is, it takes us outside the Middle East, but uh, to what extent was my sort of view of U.S. Middle East policy uh, <coughs> applicable in other parts of the world? Uh, I think it uh, applies in spades to Europe because despite what you may have heard about Russia, Russia is not in fact a mortal threat to Western Europe now, um, and Europe has the wherewithal if it chooses to, to defend itself against any conceivable uh, Russian threat. Um, I don't think we, I think we should stay in NATO, I think we should continue to have, you know, security partnerships there, but we don't need to leave a lot of forces there. That's actually, we should be encouraging the Europeans to do a lot, a lot more. The place where I think it gets tricky, as your question implied, is Asia. Uh, what should the American role in Asia be? And there, I think it depends very much on what China's trajectory looks like over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, the United States has, for 100 years or more, basically wanted to be the only regional hegemon in the world. We're the hegemonic power in the Western Hemisphere. This is what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. Right? No other great powers in the Western Hemisphere and no outside powers with close security ties in the Western Hemisphere. That's why Cuba kept driving us crazy. Right? Um, Cuba was, was inconsequential, but had its relationship with the Soviet Union. So, and at the same time, we don't want any other major power to have a position in its neighborhood like our position in the Western Hemisphere. Right? And why? You can disagree with this. I'm just explaining it. It's because if, if a country like China dominated Asia, had no real security problems in Asia because they dominated it the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere, then China, which by the way, you know, has what, four or five times as many people as us and will eventually have an economy larger than ours, etc. China could then interfere in other parts of the world in ways we might find unpleasant and uncomfortable. They might even start forming alliances with countries in the Western Hemisphere. All right. um, so that's the, the great long-term concern from a just purely strategic perspective. The United States would rather China have to worry about Japan and Korea and Australia and India and Vietnam and Russia and some others so that it couldn't focus its attention on anywhere. Because after all, if China dominated its region like we dominate the Western Hemisphere, then they could wander around the world getting into trouble the way we wander around the world. Getting into trouble. So the place where the United States is probably going to have to pay a lot of attention is Asia. It's, it will require partners in Asia to do that. How much it has to do depends on whether what's been happening to the Chinese economy over the last couple of months continues or whether this is just a blip and eventually they resume the sort of rise. It also depends on the decisions that the Chinese make about how assertive they wish to be as well. I'm not forecasting a you know, World War III with China. We have lots of reasons to cooperate with them on other issues. But if I had to bet, I would say that, that the relationship is going to be harder to maintain over time and the United States is going to spend more of its time and effort on strategic issues in Asia than it has in other parts of the world. Anita. Since we're responsible uh, for a lot of the humanitarian mess in the Middle East, are we, what's a policy that we as Americans are, are able to support humanitarian aid for refugees? Yeah, uh, I, I think we ought to be doing Please. a lot. Uh, the question is what role should we play uh, in humanitarian terms? I mean, humanitarian assistance is, is almost always a good thing. There are some really clever arguments people have made about how humanitarian assistance may, may be bad, right? Sort of moral hazard arguments that if, you know, if you do too much for refugees, it encourages governments to throw them out and then they go on somebody else's uh, you know, payroll or, or whatever. But I think that's silly. I think that we should have been doing much more for, say, the refugees from Syria than we have been all along, along with other countries a, as well. It's unambiguously a, a good thing to try and save lives when people are having to flee a war zone uh, as well, and usually doesn't cause us a lot of subsequent, uh, subsequent trouble. The place I, I have somewhat more questions is when people look at what are genuine humanitarian tragedies and say, well, the thing we need to do to solve that is send the Marines. Um, or, you know, whatever. Um, and I, that I'm not opposed to doing when 
the threat to human life is really large and, most importantly, and we really do have a plausible strategy for solving the problem rather than making it worse. And I think, for example, as hard as this is to say, uh, I think Obama made the right call in not, re not engaging directly in the Syrian civil war. Um, even though he got a lot of criticism for it, because I think we would have ended up making it even worse, if that's possible to imagine. That, I should add, is a debatable point. I, mean, I can't prove it. That's just my instinct. But with our European friends now that have people on their doorsteps, are we, are we helping to support the... We're, no, but the Europeans, again, Europe is a wealthy continent, despite the financial crisis. I don't think we have to be sending aid to Europe to help them deal with the refugee problem. And the refugee problem is less a monetary issue than a political issue for Europe right now. <coughs> Let's say thank you to Dr. Walford. And his Dr. Walton say that he'd be happy for personal conversations for a while if you want to come up and have a conversation with him and talk with him a little bit more after he gets a glass of water or if you want one of your books to be signed please come up and grab him. I do want to say three last things very very quickly. Number one we have petitions in the back that's, that thank Senator Donnelly for his support for the Iran deal and we're urging uh, Senator Coates and Representative Stutzman to reconsider their opposition to the Iran deal. Those uh, petitions are in the back. Secondly, if you want to be on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace email list, there's a sheet of paper in the back. Please give us your name and email address so that you can be uh, uh, apprised of upcoming uh, uh, presentations. And third, we're selling tickets for uh, our gala on September the 19th with Archbishop Elias Shakur. Those tickets are being sold in the back too. Have some sweets and treats and goodies, and thanks for coming tonight, and Godspeed on your way home. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, <laughs>